morning. morning. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. Merry Christmas. Beautiful time of the year to celebrate the um, first Advent and to look forward to the second Advent. It's a wonderful time. I, um, as was mentioned, my name is Tom Murray. I serve as the treasurer of the Southern New England Conference, and um, I consider it a privilege to be at your service, to be at the Lord's service in what we do. Um, many years ago, I haven't always been in, in um, church work in my career. I haven't always been in church-related work. And one day I was praying, and I have a kind of a, I don't know if you have a place where you go sometimes when you have to have a real serious prayer, you know. And I was, I was needing to uh, go to my place where I walk and I have my prayer. That doesn't mean we can't pray everywhere, but this spot is, is kind of special to me. And I'm walking along in the words to the song, Pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, while on others you are calling. Do not pass me by. I'm not going to repeat everything. <laughs> Do not pass me by. Um, and so God has been good, and he's allowed me to serve, and he's allowed all of us to serve. We all want to serve. None of us want to be passed by. Pass me not. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. I want to share a story with you this morning. It's an old story about a young man, okay? And, it, and, and, and from the story, I want to lead into a, a message of hope and, and, and victory in, in, in knowing Jesus Christ. It's an old, as I said, it's an old story about a young man. We're going to call him Fred. Uh, Fred was about to embark on an ambitious venture that would, would actually alter the course of his future. Fred was six, and it was his first day at school. Determined to be brave, but holding tightly to his mom's hand, um, his mother led him to, uh, you know, into the school building. To Fred, the building seemed just massive to Fred. It was bigger than any place he'd been. It was a massive building with a tower that seemingly pierced the clouds. Going directly to the first grade room following his mother, his mother introduced him to the teacher, Mrs. Carlson, and then she left. And there he was, Fred, kind of by himself. There was others, but he, wow, mom has left. And, 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 and he was there to just kind of face all of the unknowns by himself. And what was school going to be all about? He knew he had to go, and he'd been preparing, and he had his new lunch pail, and he had his outfit and everything else. But what was it going to be like? He'd heard some stories. He'd heard kind of from people what it might be like, but nothing that he really could, you know, understand or believe. And, and, and Fred was nervous. He, he was nervous. You know, when we get into a strange environment, we get nervous. And Fred's six years old. His mom's left. A bunch of strange people. He's nervous, and he needs answers. And Fred needs answers fast. He needs them fast. He's, he, and he, and, he, and he, he didn't want answers from the fellow first graders. They all looked as bewildered as him. Okay, they, you know, they're all new too. He didn't, you know, he wasn't looking for that. He didn't want to ask Mrs. Carlson. She was an adult. She wasn't going to help in this time, you know, because he was nervous. He wanted to talk kid to kid, but not necessarily to his fellow first graders. Well, the answers started to come at the most, at, 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 at the part of the day that made the most sense to Fred at recess. Okay, recess he could identify with. He said, recess, we're going to, and, and as, as fortune would have it, a second grader came up to, to uh, um, Fred on the playground, and he says, my name's Pete. He says, I'm a second grader. Oh, this was the break that Pete was look, that uh, Fred was looking for. Um, that, that, you know, here he was, a lowly, just a beginning first grader, didn't know which thing, what thing to do, what was going to happen next. And Fred came over, be, you know, an exalted, world-wise, experienced second grader came and, 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 um, 
you know, Pete had been over this road before, Fred thought, you know, this is going to be helpful to me uh, if I could just, uh, you know, speak to, um, uh, to um, Pete and, and maybe draw from the, the wealth of, of information that he might have having already been through one entire year of school. He could speak from a, a vast, vast storehouse of experience that he had as a second grader. Clearly, Pete was going to be very helpful to, to Fred, and he was most willing to share. It turns out Pete was a talker. He was most willing to share, and, and that's exactly what he did. He started sharing and telling about, you know, his, his, you know, his testimony about having been through the first grade and, and what was going on. And in the middle of his testimony, as he's given this testimony, Fred interrupted him and said, who is that man across the playground? And Fred's countenance kind of got real serious, and, and um, his voice lowered, and he said, um, that's Mr. Smith. He's the principal. Principal? What does a principal do, Fred asks. Pete motioned him a little closer, talked in kind of a little quieter tones, and he says, um, the principal's job is to punish kids. That's what he does. He punishes kids. He finds them. He finds them doing something, and he punishes kids. And it's worse. Mr. Smith has an office way up on the second floor, way up on the second floor, all the way to the top of the building, second floor. He's got an office up there. You don't usually see in there, but in that office... There's a paddling machine. There's a paddling machine in that office. And one wrong move, and you'll get to feel the sting on your backside of the paddling machine. Well, Fred couldn't believe what he heard. He, he almost fainted. He said, I can't believe it. I've, I've kind of heard stories about this, but right here in our school, we've got Mr. Smith, in his paddling machine, and he's roving the playground looking for who might do something wrong so that he can put him in. Fred was just so upset that, you know, chills ran up and down his spine, and, and Pete continued with the stories relentlessly. He says, you need to stay away from Mr. Smith. He says, you have to stay away from him. His whole purpose is to just find children and punish them. Keep away from the office, as a matter of fact. Not just Mr. Smith. Keep away from the office. Fred asked Pete, have you ever been put in the paddling machine? Pete says, oh, no, 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 no. He says, I stay away. I stay away from Mr. Smith. I stay away from the office. I have not. Then how do you know, Pete, uh, Fred says, how do you know that there's really a paddling machine? He, Pete says, I have seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. I've seen the paddling machine. Back in the classroom, Fred quickly learned that other first graders had been approached by, by um, second graders who were, you know, who were concerned and were sharing the same story with missionary zeal. The second graders had fanned out across the playground, bearing testimony, one-on-one -on -one witnessing as to what was out, what was going on there uh, with Mr. Smith. They were proclaiming this urgent alarm that they felt that they needed to share with these new first graders. The next Wednesday brought Fred and his fellow first graders even closer to peril. Mrs. Carlson explained that each Wednesday, the students in all grades were to grow, go upstairs to the auditorium statue. Well, what was a, 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 a chapel? And what was upstairs, you know, near the chapel, but the principal's office. So they were all a little bit nervous. The entire class lined up in the hallway outside the classroom. The first thing Mrs. Carlson had, had taught all of them was to line up. It seemed like lining up was a, a fundamental principle in education. Lining up was important. And they all lined up kind of at the bottom of the stairs. And, and, and as they were lining up, the first graders looked up the stairs. And there was, the, there was a door near the top of the stairs, and it was a door to the principal's office. They didn't want to go upstairs. They didn't want to get near the principal's office because they had all heard about Mr. Smith and the paddling machine, and they were frantic. They were just, just didn't want to do this. 
you know, as the stairs went by the principal's office, they turned and they went up to the auditorium. And the, and the first graders stood there looking up the stairs and just thinking, oh, how are we going to do this, you know? And they're looking at each other, and, 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 and um, there's the door, and, and they're thinking, how are we going to do this? And, and um, Mrs. Carlson, Miss Carlson um, gave the directive, okay, uh, children, it's time to go upstairs because we're going to have assembly upstairs. And, and, and not realizing their, their nervousness, um, n n you know, when she said that, nobody moved. Nobody moved. Nobody wanted to start climbing those stairs because it went right past the principal's office. And so in firmer tones, Ms. Ms. Carlson said, you need to go upstairs. Start going upstairs. And the kids were frantic. Well, finally, after some bribing, perhaps, or encouraging, or threatening, the, finally the kids started to slowly slowly uh, move up the stairs and, and near the landing when they'd go by the principal office's do office door, um, it was closed, thankfully the door was closed and they would race by that door so fast. And, 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 and finally they all made it. They all made it up to the um, auditorium where they were gonna have the assembly and the first graders all kind of got together and they, they grouped together and just made, you know, took kind of took inventory. Is everybody here? And thankfully nobody had been taken. Nobody had been taken. They had all made it to the, to, the, to the assembly. Nobody had been lost. Many Wednesdays, however, lay ahead for, for young Fred and his, and, and his, and his classmates. And, and this ritual played out, it seemed, every week that they'd have to line up and they'd see that door. Luckily, the door was closed and they'd race past that door. As the weeks went on, and every week they went by, and and, and it went okay. There, um, although nobody really wanted to openly talk about it or admit it, their belief in the paddling machine doctrine that they had been taught was was slowly showing some signs of kind of coming unraveled. You know, is it is this is this real? Is this story for real? A few bold, of the more bold, brave first graders. A few of the first graders actually, when they went by the door. Um, they would actually do a little bit of clowning around as they went by the door, a little dancing, a little, a little bit of uh, mocking as they, as they went by the door. And then one Wednesday, it happened. As they lined up at the bottom of the stairs, they looked up and they saw a terrifying sight. The principal's office door was open. <laughs> It was open. They lined up and this just, this just slowed down even the bravest among the, the first graders and, 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 and a fear reminiscent of that first Wednesday when they were just terrified. This, this newly humbled group of, of first graders slowly ascended those stairs and carefully went up and at the landing each one race past the door just as fast as they could, just get by that door, you know, and each one taking their turn because who knows what can happen inside that office, Mr. Smith's office. As Fred went by, as he was going by, he looked inside. He looked inside, and he, he had a quick look, but he saw inside, and there was a desk, and there were some chairs, but over against the wall, there it was. He saw it. It was black. It was dark. It was, it was big. It was foreboding. It was ominous. There it was. The paddling machine. The paddling machine. Now Fred had seen it with his own eyes. He had laid his own eyes on this big, dark paddling machine on the, in the back of the office as if, the, as if he couldn't see it. He saw it, and he knew it. At the first opportunity, the first graders got together to discuss their experience of racing by the door. Just about everyone, it turns out, just about everyone had looked into the door as they went by, and they all saw in the back of the office, big and foreboding, the paddling machine. Unbelievably, Pete and the other second graders were vindicated. There it was. They'd seen it with their own eyes. How could the first graders have ever doubted the warning that these generous second graders had given to them? Their belief in the paddling machine was, uh, doctrine was now cemented. They had seen it with their own eyes. 
the school year passed. Mr. Smith had not grabbed a single first grader. They credit this good fortune to their unwavering vigilance and care in racing by that office. Summer vacation came, and summer vacation went, and it was time for a new school year, and, and Fred found himself, this time, not going in with mommy, but trudging into school by himself, back to school, this time, however, not as a lowly, vulnerable first grader, but as a seasoned, savvy, streetwise second grader. At the first recess, of the school year, the new second graders instant, instinctively took up the, uh, the torch. They spread the alarm. They told the story to the first graders. They saturated the playground with their personal testimony and heralded, heralded the dark message of Mr. Smith and the paddling machine. And so it went. And so it goes. And so it goes. We get all worked up, it seems, about something we think we understand. And sometimes that applies to our understanding of our Heavenly Father, it seems, doesn't it? We want to talk about how bad it's going to be. As the years passed, Fred, Fred's class learned that what they had believed was a paddling machine was actually a duplicating machine, a copy machine. It just seems, in our experience, in my experience, perhaps your experience, it does seem that in our faith community, sometimes we get so worked up about that paddling machine that isn't even a paddling machine. We get so worked up about the stories that people have told us about, this is going to get you, that's going to get you, that's going to cost you, you're going to pay. We get so wrapped up in that, and we connect that we connect that with our spiritual experience. Whether we try to or not, sometimes it just, it just gets connected. We tend to present our Heavenly Father like the second graders presented Mr. Smith as a God of punishment, a God who's looking for where you're going to mess things up and how he's going to get you. And, and when you think about it, and I believe we've all been there. I believe we've all received this kind of, this, 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 paddling machine theology. We've all received it in may perhaps in our younger years, perhaps even today. Perhaps we even, sometimes maybe we even spread it. Sometimes we even get into it and say, ah, this is not going to make, mm, this is not going to work. You know, and, and how, when you think about it, when you really think about our God and, and, and um, how he's not willing, as we just read, my brother, Orville, just read, God Almighty, the God of creation, the God of love, the God who is love, he is not willing that any one, any one should perish. How it must break his heart when we look at him in such a way that he's looking for a way for us not to have victorious lives here and for eternity. This is his wish. It is not his wish that any one of us should perish. God is love. That's biblical truth. God is love. It's, it's, it's interesting the way it's, it's put in, in, in the apostle John puts it. John the Apostle John didn't say God's really, really good at love, you know, or, or, or he didn't say he's a real loving God, you know. He said God is love. So whatever love is, that's what God is. God is love. God is not fear. He doesn't wish for his family to live in fear, for any one of us to live like a first grader at the school, you know, or afraid to get near the office, afraid to get near this room, this place, this fellowship, nervous or afraid to be near. If we know of anybody in our family, and, and there are people in this congregation, in this family, who feel a little reluctant to come to this place because what are they going to say? What are they going to think? And I'm not picking on you. My church is the same way, and I've been the same way. 
I've been the same way. We have to go out of our way to exhibit a different kind of love where people feel very, very safe to come in this place. Where people feel that there is nothing but God and God is love. There is nothing but love in this place. Nothing but love. We can disagree among ourselves. We can see things differently. But when they come into this place, into this room, they feel nothing but the love of God because God is love. And this is his house. This is his place. He's not given us a spirit, spirit of fear or timidity, timidity, but of power. This is 2 Timothy 1.7, one of my favorites. A spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Have you ever wished as a faith community we could do a better job of sharing good news? You ever wish that we could do as good a job sharing the good news as we do of sharing the other stuff, you know, and talking about the nonsense? We can get all wrapped up in talking about the headlines, which can drive you nuts, that can bring you down, okay? We spend all kind of time talking about that. Do you ever wish as a faith community we could do a better job saying, you are loved, we appreciate you, we love you, I want to be with you, I want you to come to church with me, I want you to, or, or let's just go have a time together you know let's just be together I appreciate you do we ever wish that we could be that to our neighbors with where, where everybody everybody in the neighborhood looks to your house and say that's a happy family those are happy people those are fun people you know do you ever wish that as a community we could be like that I appreciated your your story this morning you've got a happy countenance James right James you got a happy disposition a happy countenance I want to be like James I want to be like James, just a happy disposition, a happy countenance. Do you ever wish all of us, for me, for all of us, that we could have that happy disposition that draws people, that they want to be close to us? God is love. God is love. We love God. Okay, we're trying to serve him. Pass me not. I want to be like you. I want to be like your son. God is love. He's always love. He's always been love. He always will be love. He's always, always love. Love is as the Bible puts it in the King James Version, perhaps all of them, the Bible says his love is from everlasting to everlasting. You don't get bigger than that, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't go further back than that, and it doesn't go further in the future than everlasting to everlasting. It never fails. God is not willing, as Orville sh shared with us, that any one of us should perish, but that we should all find repentance and victory in Jesus Christ. His love is best enjoyed and most completely enjoyed when we step out in courage, when we step out in faithfulness, when we pray, and when we seek him. It's energizing. His love is energizing. We feel it sometimes more than others, right? Sometimes you feel it more than others, and you feel, you, you know you're feeling it. You know you're feeling God's love going through your, your veins. You know that, and you say, Lord, I want this all the time. I want this, and I need this. And he takes us on journeys. And we were discussing this morning in the, in the Sabbath school lesson. We get taken on journeys that sometimes we're going, Lord, really? Really, Lord? But we know, you know, we know that God is love, and his, his love is liberating and empowering God is love. I love the way that the Apostle Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians 13. If God is love, this is what he is. Love is patient. Love is kind, right? Love, is, love does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres, and it never fails. God's love never fails because it's who he is, and he's perfect. He is perfect. He's above humanity. He's not saddled with what we're saddled with. His love never, ever fails. His love is so gracious for us fallen human beings that the... Um, he sent his son, and he sent himself because it was him. It was him, and he came 
And as the Bible tells us, Emmanuel, he came to be with us, to experience what we experience, to know and to feel and to hurt and to wish and to wonder and to cry and to mourn. He came to do that. He needed to. He needed to. Have you ever had one of your friends, a dear person, a family member that's suffering, and you just wish, could I take this? You know, could I take this? He wanted to take it for every single one of us. Every one of us. He wanted that. He sent his son to be our guide, to be our companion, to be our redeemer, to redeem our sins. That was the living embodiment and proof of his love for us Jesus 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 is a God he's a person and he's proof he's proof of God's love for us where all where where there are prophecies Paul goes on to say they will they will cease where there is tongues they will be stilled where there is knowledge it will pass away where there's paddling machine theology, it will pass away. It's going to pass away. And, 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 and for those of us who have, have been raised on paddling machine doctrines and theologies, it will pass away in the light and the brightness of his love. In the final day, after all the dust has settled and all the tears have been shed, Three things will remain, three things, faith and hope and love. Scripture again instructs us, the greatest of these is love, because it's what God is. God is love. In the final analysis, when all the dust is settled, when all the tears have been shed, love wins. Love wins. That's why it's an honor and a privilege to come to this place and celebrate this love every week. That's why he wanted it for us. He wanted this for us, that we could come to this place and know, know his love and feel his love and share his love in the safety of this place and then from this place move out and share that love in this community and in the next community and beyond and all over the planet. Many of us have been raised, perhaps even indoctrinated into a theology and a doctrine that's not representative of who he is. It's not representative. This is why we have to be into our, into scripture daily. It's only when we're into scripture and on our knees that we understand that it's a transcript of his love for us. It's a transcript of his patience and kindness for us as, as we read about in, in, in um, 1 Corinthians 13. It's about his long suffering with us. Let us remind ourselves and those that we care for and that we love that God is love. We will never be able to force our version of the truth or our desired outcomes with paddling machine threats or theology. That's darkness. And in the light of God's love, there's no room for that kind of darkness. We can encourage each other. That's why we get to come here every week. That's why, please, let's remember, please, invite those who haven't been here, you know, reach out. Give a call. Say we miss you. We miss you loving with us. You know, we miss you being with us, and we're just thinking about you. That's a privilege. It's a privilege. We can never rightly represent him without reaching out in love. Let everything we do be done in love everything that we do. We have a privilege of sharing who he truly is. That's a privilege. That's a privilege. Where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. But faith, hope, and love will remain.
and the greatest of these is love. There's a um, hymn that we're going to sing, and it's got beautiful um, lyrics. And I am going to read the hymn in closing before we sing it, because when we sing it, I want us to feel the words, okay? I want, I want us to really, really feel the words. It's a, it's a hymn. It's uh, by Priscilla Jane Owens. Um, she tells a story in the hymns. Uh, we have heard a joyful sound is, 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 is the hymn, and we'll sing it together. But I just want to read the words, and I want you to hear the words. I want you to absorb the meaning of these words because there is a whole sermon, there's a whole ministry in this one hymn. In these words, we have heard, and think about it, we have heard, we have heard, we, in this room, we have heard the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the gladness all around, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land, climb the steeps and cross the waves, onward is the Lord's command, Jesus saves. Wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves. Tell to sinners far and wide, Jesus saves. Sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean caves. Earth shall keep her jubilee, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife. Jesus saves by his death and endless life. Jesus saves. This part always gets me. I may even choke when I say it. <laughs> Sing it softly through the gloom when the heart for mercy craves. Sing in triumph over tomb. Jesus saves. Give the winds a mighty voice. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Now. Now rejoice. Because we know. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hills and deepest caves. This our song of victory. Jesus saves. I want to thank you for the opportunity. I want to thank him for the opportunity to come together and to recognize that Jesus saves, to recognize that any of the paddle machine, it's a silly little vignette, any of the paddling machine theologies or doctrines that they've tried to put upon us through many years, that it all boils down to Jesus Jesus. Jesus saves. Jesus saves. Thank you. God bless. Happy Sabbath.